Okay, we all ready to start, everybody? Yes? You ready to start? Oh my gosh, with, with deep breaths as well. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. It's still morning, yes? Yes, it's good. Okay. Um, my name's Rob Waring. I'm based in Japan, and I've been involved with extensive reading now for some 20, 25 years or so, quite a long while. And um, my interest in extensive reading also is um, an interest in extensive listening. Um, but I'm going to be talking about extensive reading only today, but many of the things that I'm talking about with extensive listening um, kind of apply. Um, but I want to ask the question, what exactly is extensive reading? And this has come out of quite a lot of talks that I've had with people. Um, a couple, two, three weeks ago, I was in Dubai at the World Third Extensive Reading Congress from the Extensive Reading Foundation. And I go to quite a lot of extensive reading conferences to, to, to give talks, and I talk to people in many, many different places. And what I hear is that there's a kind of a folk understanding of extensive reading. That is, we all kind of know what we're talking about, but when we get down to the details, we're not exactly sure. And one of the problems that we get is that the people who are talking about extensive reading don't always talk about the same thing. And I want to put forward the case that we need to be a little bit more careful about what we're talking about when we're talking about extensive reading. So let me start at the start where extensive reading comes from. So a potted history of extensive reading. Um, these slides, by the way, uh, you don't need to take pictures. If you want to take pictures, that's fine. No problem. Make sure you get my handsome face in there. Um, <laughs> but when you... Um, it, if, when I finish the, the, the uh, PowerPoint, um, you will see a link to go and download this. So it's available. Just And when you want to download it, just use it, abuse it, use it in your own session, sell it on eBay. I don't mind. Do what you want with it. Um, go ahead. Just spread the word. That's all that's important. So product history of extensive reading. So there's always been graded reading. Now, I make a distinction between graded reading and extensive listening. Um, extensive listening... Well, um, historically, has always been connected with an educated person. If you look back at the literature where people say extensive reading in the 1920s, 1900s, 1930s, what they refer to is reading widely, particularly the classics, um, Latin, Greek, French, English literature, French literature, uh, reading some science, reading some physics, reading all kinds of different things. That was extensive reading mostly in first language. So extensive reading has that meaning still, which is read a lot. We're all familiar with reading a lot. But for me, the difference between graded reading and extensive reading is graded, of course, refers to has been simplified for a specific audience. So we might control the vocabulary, we might control the grammar, we might control the plot, so that reading is at various difficulty levels. So extensive reading and, and graded reading for EFL generally tends to be much the same thing. We can swap the, the, the terms over. But there is a distinction that extensive reading can include native materials as well. Graded reading, by its definition, cannot. Because, of course, it's specifically for second language or foreign language learners. Anyway, going back, the... The basal reading series, um, the early reading series, were developed by uh, people called Ogden, Michael West, maybe you're familiar with, Hornby, Palmer, who was in Japan for quite some time. And West's supplemental readers were amongst the first graded readers um, that were written with a controlled vocabulary. And this was from the vocabulary movement, vocabulary control movement of the 1920s, 1930s, and was very, very important. So people like Ogden and West both came up with uh, word lists of limited numbers of words which students should learn, and I'm sure you're familiar with those. But there were main principles behind Michael West's work, which was use only previously met words, yes, which is a principle we have for extensive reading, uh, graded readers. Extra practice, we stretch the vocabulary to allow readers to see new meanings, so it's not just book paper, it's book a hotel room, for example, not just bank financial, but bank of a river and various other things. And to enable them to build a foundation for further reading. And the idea, of course, with extensive reading, or this type of extensive reading, 
was to build a foundation so that they could go on to eventually read native materials. So the supplemental readers, West supplemental readers, highlighted new words in bold. So there was specific focus on them. You were supposed to pay attention to them, which is not kind of what we do in graded reading nowadays, at least in most graded reading series. So this is the cover of uh, his book, New Method Readers, and is one form. They're very, very popular books. Um, they're actually, if you can get hold of them, you can sell them for a profit nowadays. They're, um, they're quite difficult to get hold of. Um, so if you do get them, please uh, hold on to them for a little while. You'll make a little fortune in a few years' time. So come to the 1970s, a man called John Milne uh, basically changed the way we wrote graded readers. Historically, it was with Michael West, as has been about vocabulary control. But now John Milne says, well, vocab's fine, but we have to have good writing. A lot of the reading uh, or writing that was done in the 1930s, 1940s, was John went up the hill, Mary went up the hill. You know, kind of boring, very, uh, um, very, very simple sentences that were just displaying grammar. They weren't really supposed to be stories. And John Milne said, no, 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 we can actually write good stories with this. We need to think about the plot, the characters, relevant content carefully explain certain words if they are um, not in the word list. High redundancy. Redundancy here means uh, extra explanation of words. We add a lot of extra context to the, to the words, to the meaning, to make sure it's understood. Good control over the information, not just the language, and intuitive grading and structure control. So the idea is the writer would say, look, I'm writing for an intermediate level student. I'm going to imagine... Uh, the student Jisung, and I'm going to write to Jisung because I know Jisung is an elementary level or intermediate level student. So intuitive writing. We don't worry too much about the grammar. So this led to the modern graded reader, which we're all familiar with um, at the moment, and to the Extensive Reading Foundation Milne Award, which is for um, excellent contributions to extensive reading. So... When we get to define extensive reading, we need to think about it in two separate spheres, one of which is the pedagogy, the sort of the teaching side of things, the teaching side of extensive reading. But we also need to think about extensive reading in terms of its research and extensive listening in terms of its research. And the two are not always the same. So when we talk about the pedagogy of extensive reading, I'm talking about building speed, what type of materials we use, um, what are the levels, the levels of books, the levels of students, levels of materials, how do we build libraries, what do we do for book record systems, what kind of activities do we have around extensive reading. So I call that the pedagogy of extensive reading. And I'll come back to explain why the difference between the two is quite important in a moment. But when we talk about the research side of extensive reading, we're talking about the academic papers, maybe reports. Uh, even at a conference like this, you may be reporting what you have done in your program. Um, and so we have sort of the exchange of ideas, if you will, all comparing programs. And this is an area that we start to get a little bit messy. So why is it important to define extensive reading, extensive listening? Well, Obviously, so we all know what we're talking about. Because it's not obvious to, I think, many of us. And I hear that when people talk about extensive reading, like my extensive reading program, what about your extensive reading program, we're not always talking about the same thing. And so we want to be able to compare results between studies. If somebody says, in my extensive reading program, we found uh, students learn this number of words, and in my extensive reading program we found they learned this number of words, there's a difference, we say, huh, why is this difference? There's something wrong with the research. Well, it may be that we're comparing two completely different types of extensive reading program. And there's a couple of examples down here. So, imaginary program A is a kind of let's just read type of extensive reading, which is self-selected by the student, 300,000 words a semester, no assessment, variety of materials, and so on and so on and so on. So it's basically just get your book, sit down and read, that's all we do. Whereas the program on the right, again, is a hypothetical one, is teacher advice, so the teacher would say, well, why don't you choose this book, or why don't you choose that book, or recommended by students. Relatively few books a semester, maybe three or four books a semester. That's all they can manage in that particular program. Um, We've got the M-Reader quizzes, quite narrow ER. It might be focused on one particular area, which might be a sort of a literary focus, for example, and so on and so on and so on. And we can see that 
we can expect, in terms of research, quite different types of results than we would get from this one. But typically, we're not careful enough about explaining the difference between the two. And that's why it becomes very messy. That's why it's very difficult to follow the research and get your, your head around exactly what we mean by extensive reading. Because what you do and what your friend does may be a little bit different, but we think we're talking about extensive reading. So when we look at definitions of extensive reading, and I'm, I'm not going to bore you by putting up 20 or 30 different definitions, but typically what we get is something like this. They have to read, usually books, something easy, something fast, fluent, there's a lot of it, it's enjoyable and at their own level, therefore comprehensible. That's sort of what we get in the folk definition of extensive reading. So, but there's a bit of a problem there, but who decides what's easy, right? What is easy for one student might not be easy for another, even if they're the same ability level. What do you mean by fast? Is there a minimum speed? Can we say 30 words a minute is fast? Do we say only 200 words a minute is fast? What do we mean by fast? Um, fluent, what do we, again, what do we mean by fluent? He's a fluent reader. Does that mean he can process words quickly or process sentences quickly? Or is he processing language at the idea level where you're sort of not even thinking about words and sentences? The, the words are just going into your head and forming uh, ideas. What do we mean by a lot? Is an extensive reading program one that has only three books a semester? Or do we need, say, 100,000 words per semester? What kind of a program do you need in order to retain the name, I have an extensive reading program? And is it enjoyable? Well, quite a lot of the stuff that we read isn't enjoyable. Departmental reports, maybe some legal documents, maybe some things online that we need to read for our school might not be enjoyable. Quite a lot of the stuff that we read isn't enjoyable, but we have to read it anyway. So, but we'll come back to this in a moment. And is it at your own level? But what about reading at I plus one or I plus two? So one of the main definitions, so we have to be very careful. If our definition is too loose, then we're not going to be able to compare studies, not going to compare what you do and what I do in a meaningful sense, because we're talking about two completely things. We can't just talk about my car is fast. What type of car? Do you mean like a sports car? Do you mean like a family car? Do you mean like a big van? Yeah, we took, they're all different things doing different, um, have different functions. And if the definition is too strict, the problem will be if I say you can only call your program an extensive reading program if you do, you know, your students are reading 80 words a minute, only if you do 100,000 words a semester, and she's going to get angry with me because she's saying, no, 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 I am doing extensive reading. So we can't go around putting numbers on things and saying you can get the label, you can't get the label, right? So we've got a problem here. Where, where are we with this? Now, some of you, I guess all of you, are familiar with the top 10 principles uh, necessary for success by Dame Bamford. Are we all familiar with this? Everybody? Yes? Anybody not familiar with this? Okay, all right. So if, if you read anything to do with extensive reading um, and you want to learn about extensive reading, you will see this list just about everywhere. It's the kind of standard list that kind of is used by mo many, many people to define extensive reading. Um, and these are some of the ones. So I'm going to go through each one. So rather than read them all to you now, we'll go through them uh, over the next few slides. Now, it's important to understand that many, many people have a misunderstanding of extensive reading because they see that list as like a Ten Commandments from, from God. Extensive reading is these ten things. That is the definition of extensive reading. And if you're not doing that, you aren't therefore doing extensive reading. So I get many people come to me quite apologetically. They say, oh, Dr. Waring, I've got an extensive reading, but it's not a program that you would like because we have assessment. Or um, we only do two books a semester. It's not a real extensive reading program. Yes, it is. It's perfectly okay. My point is we have a wide range of stuff. But the point here I want to make is that both Richard Day and Julian Bamford never said, this is extensive reading. All they said was, these things 
are in many extensive reading programs. Not all of them, but the literature and many other people have started to take in this as a commandment list. We have to do this. This is the way to do extensive reading. But it's just a list of suggestions. But these things have been routinely ignored. These writers, like it's not the way, have been ignored by many people. For example, this list is often used to define extensive reading in research articles. It's also the default definition of extensive reading, despite both uh, Richard Day and Julian Bamford saying they're founding successful reading programs. This is not, this is extensive reading. But then we get the opposite, the, the extreme end, where we have a paper just recently by Rowan Chen that says, we purposely avoid using extensive reading. Um, this was because we did not investigate whether the participants had followed any of the top 10 principles of ER, meaning we can't call it extensive reading unless these things are all in place. So we have few people coming out now with this very closed idea of what extensive reading is. So let's have a look at them. The ones in red, basically, I think we can all agree with in almost any definition of extensive reading. Yes? And let's go through them. Those are the red ones. Reading is easy. Variety of reading material on a wide range of topics. Learners read as much as possible. I don't think anybody can disagree with that. But... Um, we wouldn't want to say only books. We want to have all kinds of materials. It could be web pages. It could be articles. It could be basically anything that you understand. But some programs are limited in what they can achieve. Yes, they may not have a wide variety of reading materials. They simply don't have the money or don't have access. In some countries, there are only certain things available. If you want to order Oxford, reading, uh, Oxford uh, bookworms, you can't get them in some countries, no matter what you do. So we have a problem. Number three, learners choose what they want to read. Now again, this sounds clear and obvious, but often they need guidance. I notice with my students, when I show them the library and they see 3,000 books, they go, whoa, you know, too much choice. It's like when I go and get some jam, for example, it's like 300 types of jam, it's like, which I, I'm not even gonna bother. Sometimes it's better to just say, look, Choose one of these five books. Mm. It's a lot easier sometimes for the students to have that rather than all this choice. Just like, what they do is they tend to, like, because they're so overwhelmed by the choice, that maybe what they will do is they will choose badly. Um, but also, learners, know what they, um, learners choose what they want to read, but they need guidance. But the problem with that is that in order to be a good guide for what's in your library, the teachers need to have read all the books in your library. You can't be a guide if you haven't read them, right? And how many people here have read every one of the graded readers in their library, right? <laughs> I haven't, right? But, you know, we need to invest literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours reading these graded readers so we can be a good guide. We don't have that time very often. And as I said, too much choice can bewilder. But basically, yes, learners, learners choose, that's fine. Now, the purpose of reading is usually related to pleasure, information, and general understanding. Again, we can see that where they're coming from. However, as I said before, we often have to read things we don't want to. And particularly our students, they have to read tests. Right? So we can't just let them read what they want to read because we need to prepare them for the larger amount of English, not just what they like. Um, so... Does pleasure prepare them for tests and future needs? I would suggest to you probably it doesn't. If you're only allowed to read, for example, crime novels, you'll be very, very good at understanding crime novels, but crime novels have a limited vocabulary. There'll be many, many words which don't appear in crime novels, which you will need maybe in your future life. So sometimes we need to say, well, I know you like crime, but actually you shouldn't just read crime. So we have a one of the problems here, we're only focusing on pleasure. Another one is, who defines what pleasure is? Now, for some students, they may say that uh, the reading should be easy. It's pleasurable because it's easy. Therefore, they only ever stay at level one. I don't want to try anything at level two, level three, because it's too hard for me. Right? My pleasure is level one. Level two is not pleasure. So if we say 
should be related to pleasure, we should allow them not to go up to level two, which again kind of violates one of the principles of extensive reading. We need to help them move up. But what if pleasure is only reading one series? They really like the Oxford Bookworms, or they really only like Macmillan Readers or Foundation Reading Library. Should we allow them to stay only within one series? Similarly, what for, if some people, their pleasure is a little bit of pain? They really like reading something that's got lots and lots of difficult vocabulary and difficult grammar in there. That's their pleasure. Should we deny them that? Similarly, what if pleasure to them is reading course books and grammar books? There are people out there who love working with grammar books. Yes, that's fine, but that's their pleasure. So we have to be a little bit careful here because there's an assumption that pleasure equals fiction literature. But it's not always the case. The next one. Uh, reading is its own reward. That is, we do it because we love it. Okay? Again, it seems fine. But it suggests that if reading is not your reward, if it's not something that you love, therefore you can stop it. Which again isn't something we should do as extensive reading teachers. Yes? It suggests that if you don't enjoy reading, if you don't have a love of reading, therefore you can stop. Right? Um, it also implies that all students will find their home run book soon. Their home run book is the book that they read and go, wow, English reading is fantastic. Give me more, give me more, give me more. Right? So if, it's going to, if we're going to have the assumption that students should be reading for their own reward, to become a lifelong reader, to become a lover of reading, well, it's just not going to happen for all students. I can see it as a goal, but it shouldn't always be that case. Some students will hate reading forever, yes? They're just not the reading types, yes? Some people just love listening. They just simply don't like processing words. They're oral learners. They like to talk. They don't like the idea of reading. And the other thing, too, is it suggests that assessment is unnecessary. This is a big point here. If reading is its own reward, it's saying that you don't need to assess the reading because what we're trying to do is to build lifelong readers. But that denies the opportunity for some programs to assess their students. And sometimes it's really important. In some institutions, they want to know how much has been read. They want to know who's been doing the reading. They want to know how many words students have learned. They want to know what the comprehension level is. They need to know. They may need to know for grades, for example. So there's a conflict there between the two. If we do it only for its own reward, it kind of denies assessment. And many of us use some form of assessment, whether it's how many pages per, per semester you use or how many words that they read or comprehension tests or M-reader quizzes, these types of things. Many of us use comprehension. So there's a bit of a conflict in Principle 7, Principle 6. Principle 7, reading speed is usually faster than slower. Again, it makes sense. The faster you read, generally, your comprehension goes up. Why? Because you're reading at the idea level of reading rather than reading sentences and sentences. When you read quickly, you see more words in one eye movement. And therefore, you're more likely to be reading with ideas rather than with individual words. So it makes sense that reading faster is better. But some people prefer to read slowly. That's their preference. They like to read slowly. They're, we all know learners who want to know every single word. If they don't get it, they're in the dictionary. That is their preference. That is their style. Now, clearly, we need to get them out of that at some point. But if that's their preference, we've got to be you know, aware of that. But also, there are some things that we need to read, but we must read carefully. Right? If you want to read a long academic report, for example, we read it very carefully, sometimes reread sections that we don't always understand. Legal documents. You're not going to skim, re skim read a legal document. You're going to read it very carefully. And again, students would be focused on needed to do that as well. And in some programs, if we have reading circles, um, students are given different tasks to do. One of them might be a, the word collector. Another one might be a culture collector or something like that, right? So people don't always read extensive reading materials in a fast, fluent manner. They read them for different purposes. And we should be flexible enough not to focus only on speed, but to allow them to be able to read for many different purposes. In principle eight, reading is individual and silent. Well, 
This denies the importance of sharing. If it's supposed to be individual, I shouldn't therefore be sharing my reading with you by telling you what I do or writing a report. Yes? It should be internal. It's all about me. And it should be silent. I should be reading silently. Now, this assumes that all the students' need is in their own heads. They don't need anything from outside. Um, therefore, focuses them inwards and outwards. But it kind of denies buddy reading, that is, shared reading. We read one book together. Or book clubs where you would share your reading. If it has to be individual, that's the opposite of sharing in things like book clubs. Reading while listening leads to a lot more vocabulary gains than reading only. So, why should it be silent? If listening while reading is important, then the silent notion is, is somewhat uh, denied. And reading while listening is very powerful because it, uh, it aids listening practice. And solo reading can be seen as a definition of loneliness. I was in Thailand about a month ago, and I asked why people don't read, and I was told the reason is that if you're seen reading a book in Thailand, it, people think you're lonely because it's a social culture. And it denies the oral tradition of reading aloud. We all have read aloud stories to our students. We read them to our children. We read them to young kids. And so if reading has to be silent and individual, what happened to this reading aloud that we, we should be able to do? This should be allowed in an extensive reading program. Nine, teachers orient and guide their students. Again, it makes sense that we guide them in some way about where to go and what to do. But as I said before, it assumes teachers know a lot about their students, about their preferences, and also about their books. Now, when we set up an extensive reading program before the students arrive in day one, we don't know our students at all. We have no idea what they like, right? So we can't build a program for our students the day after they arrive in our classes. We have to build a library that suits all the various students. So in terms of um, this, we've got to be quite careful that uh, it assumes that we know what we're doing. And if students are being guided and oriented, it kind of goes against this self-selection, which is principle three that we looked at before. Students should self-select. Well, this is kind of the opposite of that. So there's two opposite things going on there. And the teacher's a role model of the reader. The idea behind this is the teacher, when the students are reading uh, silently in class, the teacher is supposed to be reading something in a foreign language as well. So I'd be reading Korean or Japanese or Chinese or Spanish or something. And the idea is they're supposed to say, oh, so the teacher is just so intelligent reading a book. I want to be like my teacher. That's the idea behind role model, right? So I question that. I think, well, yes, I get the point, yes? But you don't necessarily have to be a role model in the class. I'm a teacher. I should be in the class doing something. And I think one problem with the teachers reading silently in their own language, in, a, in their second language or third language in front of students, is people can misunderstand it. The students can misunderstand it and say, we have a lazy teacher. She just sits at the front and reads. Yeah? Or, and they will get back to the parents. The parents complain to the school. Or the school administrator walks past, look in the window and say, what are you doing? You're supposed to be teaching, right? So what would happen is if an administrator sees that, they could automatically think, well, this extensive reading program is just an easy excuse, right? It's just lazy teachers do extensive reading and can create negative reactions towards extensive reading. So we have to be very aware of how people will see us, how they perceive us when we're doing that, yeah? Similarly, not all teachers are literature fanatics and lovers. And many, many people misunderstand me, who I'm quite well known for extensive reading, as though I am uh, a literature buff. And I read this, and people often ask me, have you read this, have you read that? No. Have you read this? No. Have you read this? I read one book a year, if I'm lucky. <laughs> Seriously, I just don't. I mean, I like literature, but it's not the thing that motivates me. I read lots and lots of other stuff, a lot of academic stuff and private stuff that I read. But for me, literature, it's great, but it's not something that wakes me up in the morning, right? So, but there's an assumption that you kind of have to be a literature teacher in order to be a, a reading teacher, which I don't think is a, a fair comment. And I think it's better to discuss your reading, your reading with students. So maybe in a quiet moment, you'd, you'd have a book. You'd say, hey, kids, by the way, I've just been reading this great book. If you want to, why don't you read this? Try and see if you can find this in your language. It's really good because da, 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 da. Yeah? Or just leave your big, thick Korean novel sitting on your desk. Right? People go, wow, look at my T-shirt, right? 
You don't have to be reading in front of class. There's other ways that subtly you can let it be known that you're also trying to read. The other thing, too, is that these things are not mentioned in the principles. Uh, assessment, evaluation, collaborative reading, reading while listening, follow up. You can cast your eye over these things. So under these 10 principles, a lot of the pedagogy, a lot of the stuff that many people do with extensive reading, they're not in these principles. Yeah? And I think we need to have a much wider view than what these 10 principles have come to believe to be the, or many people believe, have come to represent what extensive reading is. So also missing from the top 10 are the setting, the context. Who exactly is that list for? Is that for kids? Is it for adults? Is it for Asian learners? Is it for Hawaiian students? Is it ESL, EFL? Yes. We don't know about the role of pre, while, and post work, for example. Well, what should we do before we read, while we read, after we read? It's just not mentioned. Clear definitions of what each principle means. They're rather vague in some ways. Listening. Why is listening not mentioned at all? Right? And student desires and preferences, speed development, and so on, and so on, and so on. So there's lots missing from these definitions. So we need to be much, much wider in our view of looking at it. Um, so the top ten principles tend to have a unidimensional view. That is, there's one way. It can be easily seen to be one way as... Uh, the only way to do these things. But people who say we need to abide by these ten principles, um, which is choose your own text, read for pleasure, read without assessment, and ER as solo, um, it implies rather dangerously, I think, that there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And I think that's dangerous because we need to have a big tent. We need to allow many, many people to walk around in the tent picking and choosing what they need for their program. But there are many, many flavors, because not, no two uh, ER programs are the same. The thing that you do is not exactly the same as what you do. It's not the same as what you do. We're all different. We have different students, different levels, different materials, different goals, different amounts of time. So we have to react to our conditions. And all the other things vary at the bottom. Student needs, teachers, um, libraries, levels, and so on. So, getting to our question, what exactly is extensive reading? Well, for many people, it means reading at I plus one, or I minus one. That is, about your ability level. Does it mean reading short text? Can we say that short text is extensive reading? If you read something that's only 100 words long, but you're reading it fast, fluent, high comprehension, can we call that extensive reading? Does it have to be long? And reading for pleasure, and some of the other points that I've already made. Okay? So, as I said, the 10 principles seem to suggest there's a single way. It's not very inclusive, rather restrictive. They can lead teachers to feel guilty. I'm not doing ER properly. <laughs> right? And I've heard that countless times. We have to be, the other point I want to make as well is, if you're going to put out a list of 10 principles and say, this is what we do, it's deciding for the students. Now, maybe the principal says, you shouldn't assess students. But she wants to be assessed. I want to know whether I understand or not. I want you to check that I'm doing my reading, because if you don't check me, I'm not going to be motivated to read it. Right? So sometimes students want to be assessed. So sometimes we have to be careful. We can't just take our belief and force it on people. We need to be flexible to allow the students' views as well. And any top ten list of orders of things we have to do is naturally not going to meet everyone's needs. And it also implies that certain things are either on or off. We have it, we don't have it. So things like, you know, assessment yes or assessment no. Students select materials, others select, let the teachers select. So if you look at all those principles, this kind of we do it or we don't, we do it or we don't, right, wrong, right, wrong. And sometimes there's a, there's a climb. You know, have a little bit of assessment. We can have a lot of assessment. We need to be flexible. So, the common features of any ER program. I think if we're going to call a program extensive reading, we need to identify what we mean by that. And for me, a universal principle is that students should be reading something quickly and enjoyably with adequate comprehension so they don't need a dictionary. 
R-E-A-D. And if they're doing that, largely I would say they're doing extensive reading. But, and this is a big but, a big but, there are extensive reading programs out there that don't do this. Because they're working with very low-level learners. Maybe they're working with phonics, they're doing guided reading or phonics reading, but their aim is this. So if you're dealing with students who are really low level, who need phonics, they need sight sound correspondence, what you're trying to do is to build their knowledge enough so then they can start extensive reading, what we might call pre-extensive reading. And I would call pre-extensive reading, this preparation for extensive reading, as part of an extensive reading program. Because the aim is working towards this, okay? So, the definition should include two separate things. One of which is the process of reading. If they're reading in a certain way, then probably we can label it extensive reading, or at least aiming at that. So, ER, from one half of the definition, is a way of processing text, fast, fluent reading. And therefore, if students are reading at that level, it doesn't matter how much they read. A hundred words only, if you're reading at fast fluent, that's what we might call the cognitive side of extensive reading. Then we have the pedagogy, the big one, the selection of materials, the activities, the library management, and so on and so on and so on. How am I going? So we can see ER as a process, or we can see ER as pedagogy. Yes? I think underlying ER, just to re repeat, if we have this read something uh, enjoyably with adequate comprehension so they don't need a dictionary, then, or you're aiming towards that, then I would say, yes, you can call it an ER program. So, there's a principle by a man called Carver some time ago who came up with the word rording. And maybe some of you have never heard of the word rording. This is a linguistic term. And what it refers to is uh, the way we're going to read. So typically what we do in extensive reading, we compare intensive reading with extensive reading, as in black and white, or white and black, whichever you prefer. But I see them more on a continuum. You can be reading a little bit slow, careful, language-focused sort of reading, what well, might be your course book, or you can be roading. Now, roading, I'll come to define that in a minute. Fast, fluent, high comprehension of text. But students may be reading here, right? And then suddenly they find a difficult reading passage, and they move down here, just for a few seconds, right? And then they understand, maybe they look in their dictionary. Okay, that's fine. And then they can pick up their speed again and go back. So extensive reading also is about how your brain's processing language. It's not just... That. It's how you're processing. Are you primarily focused on the meanings in the text, understanding the story, or are you focused on the language in the text? And you can't be doing both. So within half a second, your brain can switch from here to there. Read, 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 read. Huh, what's this word? I don't know. Okay? So you can jump from one to the other. So extensive reading, intensive reading, and a cognitive perspective is something that you can change in a millisecond. Okay? Now, the pedagogical side of extensive reading, what materials we use, graded readers, we may say we use those for extensive reading rather than a course book. So, roading is a term very similar to READ, which I explained before. It's the optimal reading rate for comprehension, and one of which there's lexical access, semantic encoding, and sentential integration. Basically, that means if you're reading fast, fluent, you understand the words and you understand the sentence without really thinking about it, then you're roading, you're fast, fluent reading, R-E-A-D, as I said before. And going back to where we were before, this distinction between cognitive, ER as process, and ER as pedagogy. I think I want to make that distinction there, okay? So we need a big tent. We need to have a tent that allows many, many different flavors of extensive reading. We need to accept many students are not brought up to be responsible for their learning. Sometimes we need to re require them to do extensive reading. Um, encouragement to be self-directed learning is often ignored 
by many students in favour of clubs. So they have different choices for reading as well. Many students don't start with a home run book. We need to understand that it might take a few months, might take a year, might be never when students get uh, that home run book. They may never find one book which magically switches them on to ER. We need to understand that it's hard to find time. We need to understand that some students will always be demotivated. Always be, because they just say, look, in my life, I'm never ever going to use English. I'm going to stay in my small little town in the countryside. My dream is to work as a shoe shop manager, and I don't need English. I'll never need English in the rest of my life. I want to get married, have two kids. Why am I learning English? What the heck am I doing all this English business for? I don't need it. My honeymoon will be in Korea. Right? And there are people like that, and we should respect that. Why should we force English on them? Of course. No, res well, we should respect their decision. Their decision if they don't want English. Now, for example, maybe you're not interested in music. Maybe you're not interested in learning how to drive fast cars. I shouldn't force you to do that. Yeah? So, massive choice can overwhelm, and we need to make sure that we understand there's a, a, a big tent of stuff that we do. So what we can see here is there are actually four or five, maybe six or seven, different types of extensive reading program. One of which can be a purist program, a little bit like what we might call the crash and view. That is, just read. Pick up your book, just read, no assessment, just go and read. That's all you do, just read, Duxo, just read. Yeah? The integrated program, this is the one that most of us do. We'd have some extensive reading, we'd be tied to, say, a communication class, we'd be tied to a writing class, or some other thing. You would maybe discuss the reading, you maybe write reports about the reading. This is the kind of one that most of us do. Class reading is also fine, where all the class read the same book, and we go through it together. And that's a valid form of extensive reading, provided they are R-E-A-D. Okay? And ER is literature. Some people teach extensive reading as literature. So they might take the, you know, the Bronte sisters' books, or they might take uh, graded readers by Shakespeare, or graded readers by some other famous author, and work through them. And lastly, um, particularly common in Japan, is ER start with simple stories. You start from the very, 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 very easy books, even if you have high-level ability. So... It means there's different types of programs, each with different aims, different levels of involvement for teachers, and some programs can adopt two or more different types. So some of the time you might be doing class reading, and some of the time maybe that you're doing, um, say, uh, the integrated style, and some of the time a free reading program. And some programs are easier to start than other ones, and some are more difficult, and each time is scalable. You can, you can grow them either from one class to a whole school level or to uh, maybe a district. So this is a kind of a table of, of these differences between the classical forms, the integrated, and so on and so on and so on, and what kinds of things that you do there. Um, I don't really have much time to sort of let you dwindle over that. I've got only three or four more minutes or so. Um, but what I want to do is to stress these core elements. A core element of an extensive reading program should be aimed at, even if you're not doing it yet, even if your students are not ready for it yet, your aim is to help them to build fluency, sustained comprehension of text, large volume of material, reading over extended periods of time, and texts tend to be longer. As I say, even if you've not achieved this yet, if you're aiming at that, then fine. The big tent view says, yes, you're doing extensive reading. But we have to be very careful. We shouldn't go around dictating to people and saying, you have a program and you don't. That's unhelpful. That's not nice. I don't want to take the label away from anybody. What I want to do is to try to help people understand that there's not one form. There's so many different forms. And it's OK to do different forms. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel you need to apologize because you're not doing it well. We shouldn't specify speeds or volumes or so on. Um, and I've mentioned this point before, some ER programs may not yet be doing extensive reading. I was in Osaka recently helping the Osaka Board of Education. They've got an ER program. It's all pre-ER, pre-ER. It's all phonics level material. That's all they can do. That's the level of their kids. But I would still say that's part of an ER program. So, 
when we're talking about extensive reading, this is coming to the last two slides, we have to be careful what we're talking about. When we're talking about extensive reading, we could be talking about a different level, a different stage of learning. We might be talking about different volume, whether we have assessment or not, a different type of extensive reading or not, whether the age and so on, the speed. All of these things are variables. So when we're talking about my ER program, which one are you talking about? Which combination of these 40 or 50 different combinations of ER programs are you really talking about? And we need to be quite careful when we're talking about my ER program. My ER program isn't helpful enough, particularly for research papers. So these are examples. What you could say, I have an early reading kids pre-ER program. It's clear what you're doing. Or I have an adult fluency-based, high intermediate, assessed, integrated, high volume ER program averaging 100 words per minute. Clearly understand what you're doing. Or I'm, I have a purist, teen, elementary level, medium volume, non-assessed, fluency ER program averaging 90 words a minute. Yes. And if we start using these, if, if our communica community can start to, to use these type of labels, it would be a lot easier for us to be able to compare what you're doing and I'm doing meaningfully. So, how about you? If you have an extensive reading program, which combination do you have? Would you like to just talk to a friend? We have about a minute or so. Okay, or which, do you have a combination there? What do you do? Okay, so as I said, this, this PowerPoint is available to be downloaded if you want to have a look at it. But the, what the, the, the takeaway message from today is please be careful when you're talking about my ER program. Try to be a little bit more specific because then the other person kind of understands what you're talking about. Share that table that I mentioned before, yeah? So in conclusion, extensive reading is multifaceted. It's not just 10 principles. There's a wide range of stuff that you can do. Uh, for pedagogy, we should have a big tent. Allow basically any form of contribution, any form of combination of materials, provided a lot of R-E-A-D going on. Read uh, fast enough that's enjoyably adequate comprehension and don't need a dictionary. But for research, let's be really careful. Because what we do here is people are having research, things like, my students read graded readers, my extensive reading product, da, 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 da. But we have no idea what level they were reading those graded readers. Just because you're reading graded readers doesn't mean you have an extensive reading program, because they could be reading them intensively. So for research, it's important to have speeds, yes? Tell us how fast they were reading, how much their comprehension level was. So thank you very much. This is the slide uh, if you want to find it. And if you want to find out more, uh, please go to this site. Um, it's now lunchtime. If you have a question, please feel free to come and talk to me. Thank you for your time.